Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Truly, God is good. Truly good. Can you hit the record button on the, uh, on the uh, camera, please? Just the little red button right there. Yeah, there you go. Okay. We're recording. We're live. We're going live. If we're not live, we'll upload it later to you. Uh, I'm sorry for the mix-up with my regular people. Or I had to go, and my young, my man, uh, my AV man, he's working it out best he can. Uh, Saints of God, good evening. Again, this is Bishop Hall, uh, Christian Ministers Worship Center here in Yokosuka, Japan. We are doing uh, a study tonight on the Passover, and I'm truly thanking God that we are here in this uh, holiday, a holy day uh, type of time. Uh, God is really good, and just ask that you continue to pray for us uh, as we continue to, as we always with this uh, military ministry. Uh, keep rebuilding, uh, keep people leave, we bring more people in. So just keep continue to pray for us. Um, also pray for the country of Japan. Things have lightened up a little bit with the uh, virus, uh, but they're still somewhat quarantining people and being very cautious of who's going in and out, hoping they lift the restrictions because I have some people that would like to travel over here. And uh, also continue to pray for things that are happening over there in Ukraine. Uh, United States, uh, uh, President Biden just said genocide, and uh, well, we don't know how that's going to be reflected uh, in Putin's mind, but I guess we're going to find out. But just keep on praying. Uh, a lot of things are going on worldly, and uh, that we have to just continue to keep things in prayer. Praying for New York City uh, with the uh, incident on the um, subway. Uh, it's very scary. It happened over here in 1995. Uh, sarin gas was released in Japan uh, by a religious uh, group at the time. So uh, it's a scary thing to be in the midst of a terrorist attack, and we prayed for those families and all of those that were injured. Uh, but let's go get started. A quick word of prayer. Father God, in Jesus' glorious name, we love you. Thank you for all that you've done and doing in our life. You pray now again, Lord God, as we study thy word. You give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, as well as a rhema word, Lord God, while we are teaching uh, to bless your people. Uh, we deliver it into your hands, and we know that you will do that, what we have asked already. Uh, you've heard our prayer request, and we know already that we've already prayed for several things, and we have seen your miraculous work, and you come to pass. So be glory, honor, and praise unto you. We love you. Into your hands we commend it in Jesus' name. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Passover, and uh, I'm going to be really studying something right from the Blue Letter Bible, uh, uh, facts, uh, frequently asked questions. I want to use that as an outline, but I do want you to, uh, if, you can, if you can see me, uh, reading the Old Testament, uh, an introduction by Lawrence Bullock. Uh, talks about, uh, breaks down the Old Testament, a very good book, uh, historical accounts of what's going on in the uh, Old Testament to bring you up to date of how it was concealed but now revealed through the New Testament. And also, since we are in the Easter or Resurrection Sunday time, this book, The Feast of the Lord, uh, and it's by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal, this book is very, very good. It also gives a nice uh, Feast of the Bible outline. It breaks it out, both sides of this. I'm, I'm showing it to you because I want you to uh, get a chance to read and study more of what's going on, and it also has on the other side. It's important. This information is very important. Most Christians do not know or understand how the Feast of the Lord are actually connected to the life, death, burial, and the resurrection and the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so I'm going to just study something tonight where it says uh, Christ three days and three nights. And again, you can find this on blueletterbible.org. Very good Bible source. Put it on your computer or your iPhone. You can always have it. It breaks down Greek, breaks down Hebrew. Uh, and it's better to have a big screen when you're doing it because you can have so many uh, different open passages and uh, information uh, that is good for you. But now, uh, going to Matthew 12, 40, it reads on this wise. It says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
Now, in the Matthew 12, 40, as it says here, literally means three days and three nights, then the crucifixion cannot be on Friday. Some say rather that a literal three days, it is an old idiom referring to the two days prior to the day being spoken of. So we have found nothing to substantiate that, and the Friday crucifixion is the most widely held view due traditional celebration of what is called Easter, and which I like to refer to as Resurrection Sunday. So did the crucifixion actually take place on Wednesday? Did it take place on Thursday, or was it Friday? So let us study it. So to make the most informed estimate, we got to examine the word sabbat or sabbat. We call it sabbat in our modern day uh, language, but in the Hebrew it's actually sabbat. And it's a good word and it means uh, intermission, the day of rest, and the holy uh, uh, seventh day. And uh, when you look at it in Leviticus 23, 15, as we read it, it says that, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the sabbat, from the day that you brought the sheave of the weave offering, seven sabbats shall be complete. Uh, you can confer that with Matthew 16, 9, and also Matthew 28 and 1, where it talks about to where Mary Magdalena gone to the sepulcher on the dawn of the first day of the week, of course, which we know is Sunday, dawn, Sunday morning, early Sunday morning rising. Now, Leviticus uh, uh, 23, 1 through 4. Uh, you have to read this and understand that this is where the feast of the Lord is spoken of. Let us now, and it says in King James Version, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath or the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feast of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in there. So now, as we look about the weekly Sabbath, that day is set aside each week to honor the Lord. Uh, verse 3 defined it and says, The seventh day is the Sabbath or the Sabbath of rest, holy on vacation. Don't do any serve our work, and it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all our dwellings. So wherever we are, and we should always uh, recognize the rest day of the Lord. So these are not, uh, we got to remember, these are not the only Sabbaths. That's where the people get a lot of things wrong when you just say the Sabbath day. Uh, because now we're going to be talking about the feast and be able to break them down. And for those of you that like to follow this Jewish tradition, yes, it was on a Saturday evening, Saturday until uh, evening Sunday. Uh, so it says here, uh, as I was talking about there, high Sabbaths are related to the Hebrew feasts or the festivals that are described in Leviticus 23 through 44. Of course, that's a very long reading, and I'm not going to read all of it, but I want to uh, give you a glimpse of what it says. In 23, 4 through 8, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover, feast number one. And on the 15th day of the same month is feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you shall must eat unleavened bread. And the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day as a holy convocation you shall do no servile work. Now, when you look at the word Passover or the reason Passover, and I'm going to explain that, you want to go to Exodus chapter number 12. It begins and it talks about 12.1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto the children, or the congregation rather of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month shall you 
take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for a house. Now, when you go down uh, to verse number uh, five, your lamb shall be without blemish, male the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day, which is the day of Passover and Nisan. And uh, on the same month, in the month assembly of the congregation, Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not it raw, but it says to cook it, you'll be nothing in it. And then when you go down to verse number uh, 17, uh, 13 rather, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the house wherein you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's why it's called the Feast of Passover. When he saw the blood, pass over him. Remember, I'm in Exodus chapter number 12. So in the first day shall you be for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. You shall keep it feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses, for whosoever eat leavened bread from the first uh, day until the seventh day, the soul shall be cut off from the Israel. And in the first day, they, there shall be a holy convocation, a convocation. And again, he repeats, nor of our work after it. But remembering, leaven always represented sin. And so he is saying that for those seven days after unleavened bread, you should basically be recognizing uh, the work of the atoning debt of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Now, for example, in uh, the verses above, uh, to speak of two feasts, as it talks about Leviticus 3 and 4 through 8, Passover and unleavened bread. Passover, it starts on the 14th day of Nisan, Hebrew month, and lasts one day. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts the next day and the 15th of Nisan, and it lasts for seven days. Note this, Passover is not a high Sabbath or Sabbath day. This is important because it's often overlooked. You can tell because the usual command for a Sabbath or a Sabbath of a holy convocation and no sort of our work is to be done, it's not given for a Passover. So while Passover is a feast day, it is not a Sabbath day or Sabbath day. Why is this important? Because it's on the day that Jesus did the work of redemption. Servile work would have been unlawful on a Sabbath day or Sabbath day, so God ordained for this day to be a festival remembering the Lamb's blood that caused the angel to pass over Israel and Egypt and pointing to the Lamb who would shed his blood for all mankind. I remember when John the Baptist saw and behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. If you uh, need to understand that, he pointed to Jesus and understand that that Passover was going to happen. Jesus told his disciples, I long to hold this Passover with you uh, because it was a certain time to where he had to give his life. So Passover actually in short means Jesus died. That's what Passover means, number one, for us in this new time and age we're living. So now, one important feast about the high Sabbath day is the Feast of First Fruits. Interestingly enough, this is the day of the resurrection. So now, the Lord, the Lord set forth two Sabbath days, each of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, you can find that in Leviticus 23, 7 and 8. And uh, it reads like this. As my Bible is loading. All right. Taking longer than possible, what's normal? Okay. All right, Leviticus, come on, Bible. That's why I like reading stuff instead of having this electronic stuff, because you can have it right away. Leviticus 23, 7, and 8. Let me see if I can get it in my Bible faster. 23, 7, and 8. Yeah, look like this thing wants to play with me. All right, uh, Leviticus 23, 7 and 8. Uh, 
it reads, And the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no survival work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation, you shall do no survival work. The Lord spake to Moses, to the children of Israel, when you come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheave of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. Reason why first fruits is so important because that's the first three uh, uh, feasts into which we're speaking. Passover, he died. Unleavened bread, his body will see no corruption in the grave. Remember, it takes three days before rigor mortis set in, as the uh, coroner would tell you. And then the third feast is first fruits, first to rise from the dead. And so now, what we have to do when we're looking at, as I was reading, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's Holy Convocation, no civil work. Then Feast of Tabernacles, as you go through the remaining feasts. And Feast of Tabernacles is going to be during his second coming. That has not taken place yet as far as Christ is concerned. That is through his second coming. So uh, then you're going to have Feast of Trumpets. That's when the trumpet is going to sound, then Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. You can find a lot of information in there. I only got a half hour, so I can't go through everything, but I want you to find it up in here. So now, when we read and examine Jesus regarding his death, again, reading Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just a side note. Some people say the story of Jonah is untrue. Just the legend about it. But Jesus actually uh, disagrees with them because he quotes it. Jesus said three days and three nights. So there's no absolute, well, no, there's absolutely rather, no way to get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. So the chart in which he's talking about here, remembering a Jewish day that starts at sunset rather than midnight. And remember the Jewish calendar goes by lunar months and not by Greco months like we do now for our regular calendar. So now, First day will be Friday before sunset, night one. Friday sunset, Saturday sunrise. Day two will be Saturday sunrise, Saturday sunset. Night two, Saturday sunset, the Sunday sunrise. Day three, Sunday sunrise, then re resurrection. So assuming Jesus rose from the dead after sunrise on Sunday, which is not stated as such in the scriptures, the scriptures merely state that Mary Magdalena went to the tomb, which is Matthew, you'll find Matthew 28 and 1, to the tomb right after sunrise, and there on Tuli nights. There's no way to give three nights in this scenario. So dogmatically, we choose this position of crucifixion on Friday and resurrection on Sunday is to choose a position which is contrary to Jesus' own prophecy. So another scripture which you find in John 12 and 1, uh, this thing is not loading like it's supposed to, uh, it always did. But John 12, 1, that's why I like to have my paper. <laughs> you never can rely on these computer stuff. Uh, John 12, 1, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Uh, so so this, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, Jesus was traveling into Jericho. So if the crucifixion took place on Friday, which had to be also be Passover, then his journey took place on a Sabbath a day. So traveling that distance on a Sabbath day was legally out of the question for a person of Jewish descent or a devout Jew. So what if the crucifixion took place on Thursday? So this would certainly add the additional night we need to fulfill Jesus' prophecy. So it raises the problem with the days because you have to count partial days for either the crucifixion or the resurrection. Now, but not for both. So now, the partial days problem can be argued successfully but not conclusively because, as stated earlier, all we are told about the resurrection is that Jesus rose on the day after the weekly Sabbath. So this could be any time from Saturday, just as after sunset, to the point where Mary Magdalena saw him after sunrise. So proponents of a Thursday crucifixion might argue counting a partial day for Thursday, the crucifixion. So a day for Friday, a day for Saturday, 
and that Jesus rose just after sunset at the beginning of the fourth day, which would be count, not be counted. So in addition, there would be three full nights in between as well. So Thursday, it can be argued for the scriptures, which basically for my uh, mind, I actually believe it was Thursday night. Now, this is why. Now, it is possible to argue for a Wednesday crucifixion if you don't count partial days. Because knowing that Jesus died at 3 p.m., why is my thing acting to me like this? Knowing that he died at 3 p.m., somebody messing with my computer, man? <laughs> oh, don't tell me that the uh, thing switched on me. My Wi-Fi switched on me. That's okay. I got my paper. <laughs> Uh, that's, why I, that's why I printed my paper out. Yeah, that's what you have to do. You, you can't rely on, com com on computer. So, proponents of a Thursday crucifixion, I went over that. Wednesday crucifixion, if you don't count partial days, knowing that Jesus died at 3 p.m., you don't count the three hours as Wednesday as a full 12-hour uh, day. The scenario would be as follows. Wednesday, 3 p.m. to sunset. Wednesday, sunset to Thursday, sunrise. Day one. Thursday sunrise, Thursday sunset. Night two, Thursday sunset, Friday sunrise. Day two, Friday sunrise to Friday sunset. Night three, Friday sunset, Saturday sunrise. Day three will be Saturday sunrise to Saturday sunset. Okay, so now, so in this view, uh, Jesus is resurrected sometime between sunset on Saturday and sunrise on Sunday, which would be a partial night and therefore not counted. So now why did the early church decide it was Friday? And it reads on this wise in Mark 15, 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So now, they assumed it was the day before the Sabbath, which meant Friday. So there, here is where our background on the Sabbath shed some light. We know that since the crucifixion was on the Passover, it was automatically the day before a Sabbath. So no matter what day it was on, because the high Sabbath day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the next day. So again, no matter what day Passover was on, the next day was automatically a Sabbath day. So holding to uh, Friday, I don't know why I don't have it, holding to a Friday crucifixion really is at odds with the scriptures. I don't know why my computer is acting crazy, but it's, that's, it's doing it. But I see it on my screen up there, which is good. Oh, uh, hmm, make that something. So, holding Friday crucifixion is at odds with Scripture, and Scripture does say that it was the feast of first fruits when he rose. He rose so he knew that the resurrection was Sunday, sunset Saturday, Sunday sunrise. So, therefore, using Jesus' own words, we conclude it was a Wednesday or a Thursday crucifixion. The Catholic Church always say, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday. Is that right? Ash Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday? Yeah, something like that. Ash Wednesday, Holy Thursday, and Good Friday. So now, if we factor in two more important points, a stronger case is for a Thursday crucifixion, which you'll see on my webpage uh, on, on Facebook. When the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Bible, the 66 books written by the 40 authors over 2,000 years, we wove various clues into the text in order for us to verify the authenticity of the Bible. So as we see prophecy come to pass, we gain more respect for the word because only the God who knows the end from the beginning could predict with 100% accuracy. His plan for redemption is the message of the scriptures. It is the gospel, or as we quote it on today, is the good news. There are proclamations or subtle clues on literally every page. So the feasts were not only historic, such as celebrated once they left Egypt and settled into the promised land of Israel, but they were also prophetic, pointing to Jesus Christ, our Savior. When you read Hebrews 
8, 1, uh, and 10 through 39. Of course, that's those three chapters that are talking about him. And so when we see it here, uh, that he takes now, and uh, we're looking at it. Ah, I got my computer back. Good. Hallelujah. When we're looking at it here, the feast pointed straight to him. So it is no coincidence that Jesus was crucified on Passover the same day God saved the Hebrews from the death in Egypt by placing blood of a lamb on the doorpost and door jams, making a cross. And it is no coincidence that Jesus arose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. It is no coincidence that the church was officially given the power of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, rather, to proclaim the gospel of the feast on Pentecost. So now, you have Passover. He died. Unleavened bread. His body will see no corruption in the grave. First fruit, he rose. Fifty days after Passover, not first fruits, fifty days after Passover, he is now Pentecost. And of course, that's when the church was birthed. He birthed the first fruits that will come, which is to be known his church. 120 upper room. Peter gives the message, 3,000 souls saved. Amen? Repent, be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So now, when we finish reading this, uh, there are many other accounts in Scripture that point specifically to the redemption of mankind, which was his purpose to come into the world. When we go back to Genesis and visit Noah, it is generally held that the ark is a quote-unquote type of Jesus. Why? Because the ark saved Noah and his family from the anger of God's judgment upon the evil world. Jesus offers salvation to all the house who trust in him, sparing them from judgment for their sins. And the ark rested or finished the work of saving Noah's family on a significant day. How many days was it up there? Forty days and forty nights. Amen. And then the water subsided, and then it sat on Ararat, the, the mountain there. It's, a, it's all. And also another glimpse of what uh, Noah uh, is is how God raised the righteous, and then he cleaned off the earth, and he put the righteous down. So it's sort of a, also a look at what we're going to know as the rapture. Uh, amen. That's another, another teaching I'll do some other time. But what God instilled, uh, a calendar change explained in Exodus, which in the seventh month became the first month. Uh, let me see my Bible again. I was reading something. I want to get back to Exodus uh, 12 for you uh, because I want you to understand how things had changed uh, when it came to how much time I got. I got a few minutes. Good. I may be a little longer than... Uh, 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 yeah, then, then 30 minutes, but I got to get this out. So now, the Jewish calendar, which is based on lunar months, had its beginning at this time, which is uh, Exodus 12. So the first month was called Abib, Exodus 13 and 4, up until the Babylonian captivity. After the Babylonian captivity, the time is called Nisin. On modern calendars, it corresponds to the latter part of March and then the first part of April. So we know whenever we are in the latter part of March, or the 15th of March, I should say, until about the 15th of April, the early part of April, we are in the Jewish month called uh, Nicene. So now, here it is, uh, and I'm just getting excited about this because I love studying this. Uh, when we see the 14th Nicene Passover feast, so that would mean the prophetic illustration God caused the ark to rest from the flood, then his wrath on the evil world on the same day that Jesus rose from the dead to save mankind, future wrath upon the Christ-rejecting world. Coincidence? Not likely. So God put this in order, and it's always, Scripture always confirms his coming. That's actually what the Old Testament tells you. I'm coming. I'm coming again. I'm coming to save you. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to do it. I'm coming to do it. First announcement, of course, was Genesis uh, 3.15, where the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent. So the last argument for Thursday crucifixion, it comes from the actions of Mary Magdalena. And I'm almost finished. May, why did Mary wait until Sunday to go to the tomb with the ministering of oils and herbs? 
So if the crucifixion took place on Wednesday, then Thursday would have been the high Sabbath, making it possible for her to go to the tomb on that day. But Friday would have been a normal day with no restrictions. So on the other, no hand, on the other hand, Thursday was the day of the crucifixion. Then Friday had been the high Sabbath. Saturday would have been the weekly Sabbath, making it possibly for her to go on Friday or Saturday, or impossible rather, for her to go on Friday or Saturday. So leaving Sunday as the first legal day that she could have made the trip. So with all that said, uh, it got to be noted that the day of the week is not something we know from Scripture. So if God wanted us to know whether it was Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, it would have been clearly stated. But what do we know is that it occurred on Passover as a model of the sacrifice of the perfect lamb that was slain and that he rose again on the day of first fruits since he is the first fruit of the resurrection. So it's fine to hold a personal view but unwise to become dogmatic like some people try to be. It would celebrate, we should celebrate the cross and the resurrection every day of our earthly visit. And that's what actually on Sunday mornings, that's what we come to do, celebrate the power of the resurrection. Uh, I've had individuals, and I'm going to close. I've had individuals try to say, ain't no way. That's the, ain't no way he could have died on a Friday and then rose on Saturday because it wasn't three days. And I says, no, you're actually trying to literally think uh, naturally, and then you're trying to let the devil use you to argue the point that this incident didn't happen. Truly, it did happen. Truly, God manifested himself in flesh. Truly, God uh, came from heaven to earth to show us how the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, how we can accomplish the things that he has for us to do. Truly, God came into the world to cleanse us from sin. Truly, God came into the world to give us power over the devil. Truly, God did all of this so that we can uh, have an example to follow of the perfect man, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Adam failed at his task of being the complete man that God wanted us to be. That's why the second Adam, who is Jesus, he is now the one to whom we pattern our life after. And that's why it says there in 1 Corinthians 15 that the first man was made a living soul. That's what we were. We have living souls. Spirit man in a dirt body have a soul. But Jesus became the quickening spirit. So the life-giving spirit, in other words, make our spirit come back alive to God to have the relationship that God intended for us to have when he first made us in his image, in his likeness. We're missing his likeness. We're in his image. We can look in the mirror and say, we see God because we are in God's image. But in his likeness, that means the love, the peace, the joy, the power. That's what he wants to restore in us. And he did that through the atoning, the life, the death, the burial, I should say prophecy as well, of Jesus, our Savior. His Son came into this world to die for us so that we can be reconciled back to God and be able to accomplish the task of taking back God's people, filling them with the Word of God, which is spirit and life that feeds our spirit. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why? It's because he's feeding your spirit man. And when your spirit man is getting full, hallelujah, you'll be able to do the work that he sent for us to do. Cast out the devil, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, deaf talking, lame walking, um, mm, you name it. What he did, we can also do nowadays, and it's still happening today. We had a young lady... Uh, uh, hungry for God on Sunday, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We'll be baptizing her this week. Uh, so God is still moving in our midst. And this Passover that we must understand, Passover, he died. Unleavened bread, his body didn't see corruption. Uh, first fruits, he rose. Pentecost, birth of the church. Gathering, uh, amen, of the Feast of Weeks, if you will, as it is called. And then the Feast of tra uh, Trumpets and Tabernacles and all of that is going to happen, uh, Jubilee. Those three are going to happen upon his return. The first four feasts are now fulfilled. The next three is going to be in his second coming. But saints, I'm excited about this uh, Resurrection Sunday. 
Uh, I thank God we're going to be teaching on communion, uh, what it is, the Lord's Supper, as the Apostle call, Paul calls us in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, so individuals will be able to take and have an understanding of actually what God is doing in our midst. But I love you. I thank God for you. Uh, I pray that it got recorded. Uh, it went on Facebook. I didn't see it, but uh, we're going to see what's happening. Uh, but let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, hallelujah, for tonight's study. We thank you for the work, the atoning work of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, that which you have done for us, Lord God, to put us back in relationship with you. Help us to gain understanding. Help us to gain knowledge. And we thank you for the rhema word we receive tonight. And we pray now, God, that will give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we may accomplish all that you have for us to do. So into your hands, we thank you for prayer and answering. And we thank you for this time. Commit it into your hand for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. God keep you. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Yeah, Brother Ron, I don't know what you did, but I don't think it went on Facebook. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll just upload it later. Normally you get a thing that says, going live, Facebook. For some reason, it was on my story. <laughs> you checked it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah? Okay. Well, we'll get it figured out. We'll get it figured out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody saw it. Somebody saw it. Mike Gordon, Larry Davis, and you should be reacted to your video Passover. Oh, it went up. It went up. It went up for some reason. Hmm. Okay. It did go up. I just saw it. Yeah, because it says here, I was live. They did say that, that... Uh, yeah, 35 minutes. It went there. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't get the notification, but two people commented and they said they love it. Mike Gordon, Larry Davis, Yashuria Kawaja reacted to your Passover. Okay, good. Mm. Yeah, 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 that's good. Okay, tonight's study is the same stuff we did live. I want to go over it. I don't know. Mike, you need a copy? Levi, you got your copy? Uh, okay. And, yeah, this is it. Okay, let's, let's discuss. Uh, Y'all heard me, basically. Y'all were in here. Uh, Mike, do you want to study, Glee? Yeah. How many more? Did you get more people downstairs? Nobody else? Did y'all stand out and tell people to come on in? And nobody else? Okay. Well, anyway, that's okay. Well, I'm, uh, a lot of people come on Saturday this weekend. They're ready to eat red beans and rice and everything. Yeah. Tater salad and ribs. Not you. Ribs. Tater salad. Tater salad. <laughs> well, I'll make you some mac and cheese without some of that, whatever, you, uh, with that Velveeta. You don't like Velveeta. Yeah. Well, I, nobody ain't said it was. It gives it more thickness. Good God Almighty. Y'all nitpick it. 
I bet if you was hungry, you'd be eating that cheese. <laughs> No, you wouldn't eat it. <laughs> you get hungry enough, you'll eat it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm a po po. <laughs> well, did. We're going to do uh, mac and cheese as, as well, Saturday. Okay, because we'll do mac and cheese and just ribs. Because I think 1800 a plate for red beans and rice, potato salad, mac and cheese and ribs, you can do probably 1200 All right, yeah, okay. We'll talk about it. All right, Lord, bless us as we study these words again and have our discussion. In your glorious name we pray, amen, amen. All right. Uh, again, if y'all have not gotten this book, I don't know if it's, this is the, uh, what edition was this? I don't remember. I bought it about four years ago, maybe five, uh, some years ago. And it is a very good uh, book that teaches you about the feasts of the Bible and how they relate to uh, Jesus' uh, appointed feasts. Uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Feast of Week, which is Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Those seven are the main seven feasts of, uh, of uh, the Bible in Leviticus that uh, Moses told the uh, children of Israel. 180, let me see. Let me give you an example of what this says. Uh, the book of Leviticus uh, is... Uh, book of Numbers. Okay, the book of Leviticus contains nothing but priestly legislation, but it's not simply a jumble of laws. It was ordered. It is ordered to it in order which reveals much about Israel's religious practices. One thing is certain: these are not the customs of the time in the desert, but rather an entire code of conduct for priests and Levites who served the temple at Jerusalem. So the sacrifices and offerings demanded for great feast days can only come from a farming people. And so the very size and types of sacrifices and festivals mentioned presuppose a large population, which we know was over 700,000 people, raising many herds and crops in the promised land. So however, since sacrifice and atonement rites were practiced even in Israel's earliest period of the 6th century, priestly editors of Leviticus could include them under the words of Moses as a natural and current expression of divine commands he had first spoken in the book of Leviticus. Uh, so now, when you look at chapters 1 through 7, it tells about the sacrifices. 1 through 8, uh, 8 through 10, ordination of the priests. 11 through 15, purity laws and clean, unclean food and disease. 16, day of atonement was established. And then... Uh, Chapter 17, Holiness Code, uh, Ethical Ritual Demands, and then it tells the vow requirements that was recorded. So this book actually breaks down for you how those feasts were. Okay, so now as we look at it, I'm telling you what Leviticus is and how the priests were. Uh, how it, it pertains to Jesus is very particular because the one main scripture, and i probably use this for Sunday's preaching, uh, when he says, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. That's the main scripture right there when John is now seeing Jesus come. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. Now, so what does that Lamb represent? It? Eli. The lamb, well, yeah. What, what was it symbol? Actually, I should say, what was it symbolic of? If you were using um, the feast, it would be the lamb that was used on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. That was. Yeah. Passed right. And so that there is the lamb. And so uh, John one twenty nine, the next day John see Jesus coming into him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me coming a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. 
Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And so John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove in an abode on him. And I knew him not, but he uh, that sent me to baptize with water, the uh, same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remain on him, the same.